Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Fran Tonkas, and it's my pleasure tonight to uh, welcome and introduce you to Professor Sharon Zukin to give this public lecture um, hosted by LSC Cities and the Department of Sociology. Sharon Zukin is Professor of Sociology at Brooklyn College and at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She is an urban and an economic sociologist whose writing is very well known on cities, culture, urban change, shopping, um, and the culture and economy of, of cities more generally. Uh, amongst her many works include books on loft living, on landscapes of power, for which she won the C. Wright Mills Book Award, um, and on the culture of cities. But tonight she's going to speak in particular to the topic of her current book published this year, that is, The Naked City, um, as you see before you. The subtitle is The Death and Life of Authentic Urban Places, and there's plenty in that subtitle alone, I think, to um, spark a discussion. I mentioned the C. Wright Mills Book Award. Uh, Sharon Zukin is also the recipient of the Lind Award, for career achievement in urban sociology from the American Sociological Association. So it's a really great pl pleasure to welcome uh, one of the foremost urban sociologists internationally uh, to be with us tonight. Sharon will present uh, on the Naked City for the first part of the session. There will then be some time for questions and answers. And there are books available. The Naked City is on sale outside uh, the lecture theater. And Sharon will be pleased to sign any books uh, for anyone who would like a really authentic memento of this evening after the lecture. But uh, let me begin by welcoming Sharon Zukin. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, drizzly late afternoon and uh, subjecting yourself to, to my explanations about why I wrote a book about cities in terms of authenticity. I'm very grateful to the Cities Program and to Fran Tonkis for inviting me to LSE. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think in the Q&A after I speak. Uh, to write a book about authenticity is a, uh, a, a daring gesture, precisely because authenticity is nothing new. Or I should say, the authentic is both very old and very new. With deference to uh, British historians Terence Ranger and Eric Hobsbawm, I can really think uh, about urban spaces as inventing and reinventing and event inventing all over again their authentic social character. But I do engage with the great urbanist Jane Jacobs in emphasizing the social character of cities as being the key to their authenticity, not just the physical structures of buildings. So let's look more closely at what the authenticity of New York City is. If I asked you to name a, a part of the city uh, or a structure of the city that's authentic, you might say the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty or the Chrysler Building an image of what emeritus professor Leslie Sclair calls iconic architecture, the icons uh, that figure in our visual imagination of New York City. And a developer of uh, casinos in Las Vegas has been kind enough to group these iconic structures together uh, to present an image of authentic New York. But for those of us who live in New York, this is not the authentic New York. It's the inauthentic New York. And our image of the authentic New York is different. This is an example of what I called in a previous work vernacular landscape, the ordinary kind of urban space that New Yorkers live in and uh, use every day. This happens to be a real bakery, or it was a real bakery, on Prince Street in the neighborhood of Lower Manhattan that is called Soho. Uh, this bakery was owned by the same Italian-American family for about 80 years. And I do want to call your attention to the, uh, the facade, the brightly colored facade, and to the window display because the elements, the physical elements of 
the the uh, uh, the visual image of this authentic New York bakery recall elements of a very iconic photograph that's been important in uh, the, the noir visualization of New York City. This is a photograph that you may recognize taken by Bernice Abbott during the 1930s on Bleecker Street, not far from Prince Street in New York City. And this was a picture that you can tell from the bread price uh, was taken during the Great Depression, again, 1936, you know, during the Great Depression. Uh, perhaps the owner, perhaps a customer is peering out uh, through the window display. And what's particularly uh, noticeable, I think, is the similarity between the uh, geometrical shapes of the loaves of bread in the window and the geometrical shapes of uh, the breads in, on display in the Vesuvio Bakery many years later. But the Vesuvio Bakery is not just a visual image, or it was not just a visual image, it was also a social space. Uh, the son of the initial owners, uh, Tony uh, Dapolito, uh, was a constant presence in the shop for many years. He was also active uh, in the local community board. It's a, a part of the, the governance structure of New York City. And people went into his shop to talk, to talk with each other, to talk with Tony, uh, not just to buy a loaf of bread. And his presence helped to make this space, I think, an authentic urban space in New York. It looked, of course, like the original family bakery. Uh, this presumably is Tony and his sister with uh, the father uh, many years ago. What I want to point out, again, is the iconic element. Let's see if I can make the laser pointer work. The iconic element. Uh, it, it worked. Ah, there we go. The iconic element of the shapes of the loaves. These might be the same loaves that we saw in the first picture 80 years later. Uh, and again, in the Bernice Abbott photograph. So there's, there is some strong visual element in, in uh, the authenticity of these social spaces. Uh, in 2008, after Tony Dapolito died, uh, new owners took over the bakery and they tried to make a go of it uh, by turning the bakery into a cafe. But there were several new elements now. First of all, the, uh, it, it looks to the casual observer as though the loaves are the same. But in fact, they're different loaves. Uh, they're shaped slightly differently and the arrangement is different. Then, of course, the word cafe was added beneath the Subio Bakery, which already makes this look like a different creature or a different social space. It's rated by a dining out guide, not the case with the old bakery, and it has a menu on display. So it's, it's already quite a different social space after the death of the owner. And then it becomes a different sort of iconic space during the recession. It's a, it's a vacant storefront. Now, how are we supposed to regard this, this space? I like to regard it as an authentic urban space because of the social character of the space. And I'll get, go into that in, in detail a little bit later. But people have said, oh, you're just being nostalgic about an old space and what it represented to a population that no longer lives in that area. Because indeed, the Italian American population, which made up one of the most numerous immigrant groups in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, of New York City, uh, they have since moved on to other neighborhoods, uh, particularly in Brooklyn and Queens, and even to the suburbs of New Jersey and Long Island. So that the residents in that area of New York City, which had stretched as an Italian working class neighborhood from the area called Little Italy, all the way to the west side of Manhattan near the docks uh, at Bleecker Street, including Prince Street, in the early 20th century.
Um, so people have said, you're nostalgic for something that was but bears no relation to present demographics and present economic functions. So I wonder, am I being nostalgic or am I looking for some sort of connection between social practices and cultural identities located in a very specific <coughs> geographical area? In other words, am I looking for the urban equivalent of terroir, the French word, we don't have an English equivalent, for this mystical combination of cultural identity, social practices, and geographical location? And I was influenced in, in thinking of terroir and what an urban equivalent of terroir might be <coughs> by two very striking films, Ferbic and Bicfer. Uh, made by Georges Roupier, a French anthropologist and documentary filmmaker. I saw, I, I don't want to go into extreme degrees of personal history, but I saw these two films um, at some sort of special, uh, 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 special showing um, it, 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 in my neighborhood a few years ago, and uh, I just found them very, very moving. Farbik, the black and white film that was made earlier, looks like a documentary, but it's not exactly a documentary. I guess we'd call it a docudrama or a, um, a, uh, a fiction film made by an anthropologist who wants to document uh, social changes in a rural area of France that he is studying. And in Farbique, Rouquier shows the very painful everyday life of a peasant family um, uh, just dealing with post-war scarcity and uh, trying to, to get their, their farm working again after World War II. In Bicfer, a similar film about the same family that he made almost 40 years later, and you can see the shift from black and white to color, signals uh, the very big social and economic changes of the intervening decades. Uh, Rouquier is concerned to show what happens after the death of the patriarch of this peasant family. Uh, uh, the children are, are uh, arguing about who is going to inherit the farm or whether the property should be sold, whether they can modernize production on the farm. Uh, two of the sons have moved into town and they have different sorts of lives. Um, and I, I was just very struck by the, uh, the, the challenges to the continuity of terroir. And so what I, what, what I was looking for when trying to understand the changes at the Vesuvio Bakery, which by the way does not appear in my book at all, this is completely uh, a completely independent demonstration of the sorts of questions I'm concerned with in Naked City, uh, I, I really was searching for an urban, uh, an urban equivalent of terroir in a way that Rouquier conveyed very forcefully in his films. So why use the term authenticity? Since I've suggested it's a troublesome and troubling term. Uh, one of the criticisms that could be made is that cities are always changing and you can never seize any one moment and say this is the moment of the authentic city. Also, to talk about authenticity sounds elitist and often you'll see in a few minutes that the term authenticity is used an, a, in an elitist way to justify one vision of the city and one use of the city over other visions and other uses. You could also say it's useless because authenticity is such a chaotic concept. In particular, it includes both objective and subjective elements. Can you really say objectively, beyond the shadow of a doubt, what is an authentic space? Or what is authentic about the city? Or is it me and my vision of what is authentic that I try to propagate? And then again, authentic means something that is primordially old, usually the product of a social group, <coughs> and something that is dramatically new, usually the product of an individual, particularly an individual artiste. 
You can also criticize the use of the idea of authenticity by saying that it's much less important than material needs. Why talk about authenticity when people need jobs? Why talk about authenticity when people need to pay the rent? But indeed, part of my use of authenticity is to use cultural terms to defend people's social right to remain in place. But that's, that is a, is a preview of, of my argument. And then the catastrophic criticism is, why talk about authenticity when most people are walking around every day without ever thinking about authenticity? It's not something that, that people think about. But they do think about it, and it is around us every day. <laughs> See, I'm <right. laughs> OK, so I think it's worthwhile to talk about authenticity. First of all, it does set up a tension between what is and what ought to be, between the empirical and the normative. Because authentic means something that should, should be true, but maybe it isn't true. It also allows me to be historical and uh, to uh, take a, a step back from the, uh, the, the geographers and the sociologists and even the cultural analysts' concern with space and to bring time back into the analysis so that I can try to analyze urban spaces in terms of their evolution in time. The idea of authenticity includes a tension, an unresolved tension, between origins and new beginnings. Something can be authentic even <coughs> if it's new. Something can be authentic if it's old, but there's no population group that has an original or an aboriginal claim to being in a space. There's a fight involved in authenticity, but what's authentic is a diversity of uses and a diversity of people. And that's part of the authenticity of the city, that there is this diversity and there is contestation over the right to be in a particular space at a particular time. The idea of authenticity also brings in the dimension of personal experience and sensual experience of the city. Uh, what is authentic to me that might be shared by you is a, a pleasure in enchanted spaces. And I think what's common in these days of standardization and homogenization of spaces all over the, the world is a desire for cities to be the places of enchantment that we, that we talk about, that we visualize, that we think about, as well as places where we live and work. Uh, the idea of authenticity s maintains the cultural turn in political economic analysis that I like very much, bringing together culture and political economy rather than simply uh, uh, looking for economic solutions to economic <coughs> questions, but rather the idea of authenticity allows us to think of cultural solutions to economic questions. Uh, the cultural turn uh, that I'm thinking of uh, in connection with authenticity involves the pursuit of the self since the 1960s and, and the way that uh, in the, the, this search for a true individual identity is sometimes realized in the creation of neighborhoods and the creation of districts that express personal identity, which comes into conflict with other social groups that are not really thinking about their, their personal identity, but thinking about their cultural, their group cultural identity, and how they can sometimes, how these two different sorts of groups exert their claims to the same space. One group in pursuit of the cultural autonomy of the group, the other in pursuit of the autonomy of the individual. 
And then I think that talking about authenticity, if I can go back to those billboard advertisements for Dunkin' Donuts and Vans and, and uh, vodka, uh, does take account of consumer culture and particularly people's tastes for authentic cultural products, whatever those may be. But authenticity, as I've suggested, does act as an instrument of power uh, by justifying one group's claims of space against another group's claims of space. And that's something that has to be resolved in each specific instance. So we mustn't forget that the Vesuvio Bakery is an authentic New York space in the real estate capital of the world, or so uh, some people would like to think of New York as the real estate capital of the world. In other words, Vesuvio Bakery was created and existed, and perhaps will exist again, in a very challenging political economic context of property markets. Oh. Now we run into the, I don't know where to, where to, where to, where to do this. We run into the, the, uh, the size of this. The size. It could be. Well, this hasn't ever happened, happened uh, before. Perhaps we can move this way. <coughs> well, you've heard 50% of my presentation. Let's have a look. <coughs> Okay, how'd you do that? He just touched it. Touched it. Uh, well, stand here while I touch it again, please. What did you touch? I, try it, try that. Oh, great, thank you so much. Okay, so what I, what I want to say is that authenticity is not only uh, a visual image, but it's a set of social practices embodied in the built environment. And so what I like to think of as authenticity in, in cities includes certain elements. Place attachment, the sense of belonging. Does a, does a space allow people to feel part of a larger whole? Then that's a, a, an authentic space or a, a step towards an authentic space. Is it uh, what people call a third space? Is it a place where people encounter significant others in public? Is it an urban village uh, with all the problems of aestheticization that urban villages imply? But do we somehow see history in an authentic space? Yes, we, we do. Uh, but do we also see history that's open-ended, do uh, the way Kevin Hetherington <coughs> speaks about Kairos in, in uh, some of what he has written, uh, do we see an open sense of history unfolding in a space, not just a museumified history that's <coughs> been classed as a historical monument, but do we, do we sense history, and even a conflictual history, when we're in that space? Uh, do we have a space where people can remain if they want to remain despite economic pressures, in particular pressures in the form of rising rents. So that I think of authenticity as a key word for social sustainability of urban spaces. Now, what's happening to Vesuvio? We see that uh, the owner of the building put a, an explanation in, in the window saying that uh, uh, there, will, there will be something suitable placed in this space. And uh, I, I'm happy to say that people responded quite negatively to the landlord's uh, message. So I'm, I'm thinking that people are speaking up for authenticity here. They don't know exactly what they want. Maybe they're nostalgic for the old Vesuvio bakery, or maybe they're not. But they're saying, the landlord is not giving us the truth. We want an authentic use of this space. And then, of course, we turn to the internet and we see comments on a New York-based 
uh, property blog called curved.com that express all kinds of emotions about <laughs> this space. And we don't even know who these people are. I mean, that's the, 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 the sad thing about trying to analyze blog comments. We don't know who these people are. But they're, they're moved in some way to express a desire for an authentic <coughs> urban experience, whatever that authentic experience might be. But it's definitely not going to be a bank branch, a chain pharmacy, a condominium, or a frozen yogurt place. Okay, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm reading this. Which, uh, the first comment is quite different from the last comment, but I'm reading these as demands for authenticity, whatever authenticity is. Demands for an authentic urban experience. So let's step back for a minute from authenticity and say, wait a second, how authentic is Vesuvio Bakery really? What is it? It's a 1920s tenement building, familiar to us from uh, the journalist Jacob Reese's early 20th century uh, expose of poverty called How the Other Half Lives, or Martin Scorsese's 1970s movie Mean Streets, or Herbert Gans's 1960 uh, book The Urban <coughs> Villagers, written at the same time that Jane Jacobs wrote The Death and Life of Great American Cities, but written from a very different point of view. So if you, if you literally step back and step across the street, you see that that charming facade of Vesuvio Bakery is really only the storefront in a quite mundane tenement in which the interior conditions were probably not great. This, of course, is relevant to all the debate over preserving or demolishing the Lilong, the, the uh, Chinese alleys in the middle of Shanghai and, and Beijing. Just, just a point made in passing about the global relevance of, of uh, this little bakery in New York City. And if you step further down the street, you see that Vesuvio, uh, there on, on the, the right of of this photograph, well anyway, you can see it on the, on the right, is really an outlier in the post-1990 retail economy of Soho, which uh, is largely occupied by uh, chain stores and mostly transnational chain stores. This happens to be Swatch on Prince Street, but uh, the, the larger district of Soho is home to many chain stores uh, from H&M uh, and uh, Old Navy to uh, Emporio Armani, uh, Dior, uh, Chanel, uh, um, Uniqlo. So uh, uh, Vesuvio is really quite different from the political economic context of the entire district and no longer represents a, a normal everyday store that everybody would go to. It's also different uh, from the, uh, the um, representation of space in the map of the uh, expanded historic preservation district of Soho, which ends <coughs> over here. Oops. Can we see a red light at all? Well, uh, there it is, it's well, on the it's ceiling. Coming, it's coming. Okay, the expanded Soho historic district ends here in the middle of the block before we get to Vesuvio. So that even the historic preservationists who want to class these buildings so they can't be demolished are not concerned with the social space of Vesuvio Bakery and what it means in the, in, in the, uh, the quest for authenticity in, in a social sense, but they're only concerned with the structure, the physical structures. And uh, in this third sense, Vesuvio Bakery does not really count either. What might be a savior appears on the scene in 2009. This is uh, a man in the white jacket. This is a man who owns a small local chain of bakeries uh, that use organically grown products and, and uh, produce vegan biscuits and things. And it turns out that he signed a lease to open the third in his chain of um, organic vegan uh, bakeries here in the old Vesuvio. 
so that the old Vesuvio is, is going to be uh, revived, but in a slightly different form. <laughs> Selling vegan cupcakes instead of those round and, and ovoid Italian loaves. So we really have a, a whole set of questions here about what is authentic about Vesuvio Bakery in the year 2009 and what should be preserved as an authentic social space. This is not just a question of Soho. This is a question that affects every area of New York City as it affects many areas of London and other cities around the world. The authentic old shops are no longer with us and uh, the new shops, which are authentic for a new population, look quite different in Harlem, in Soho it itself, in larger Soho, where artists took over a, um, a diner, a, a small, cheap restaurant where the factory workers of Soho used to eat until 1971. And eventually Soho looks like this. Or in Red Hook, Brooklyn, uh, the subject of one of my uh, chapters that some of Fran's students read for a master class this afternoon. You have the derelict dock lands buildings replaced by something else. <laughs> so what I'm talking about really when I'm using the idea of authenticity is the politics of certain aesthetic positions. Uh, people with economic resources are usually concerned about embodying their cultural capital in urban spaces as markers of their personal identity. And of course, this is the, um, the social, social segment to which I belong. Uh, I just have a t-shirt emblazoned with this phrase from Pierre Bourdieu's uh, work, I'm part of the dominated part of the dominating class. Someone with a high education, but not a correspondingly high income. And it's tastes of people like me who are the gentrifiers or the artists who, uh, who move into urban spaces and say, yeah, I love Vesuvio Bakery, but in fact, I never bought bread there because it didn't taste so good. And that's exactly my aesthetic position. I loved the fact that Vesuvio Bakery and Tony Dopolito were there but I didn't buy the bread there. Now, I'm not going to say that if I had bought the bread, that store would be alive today, but um, uh, I will say that there's something about the aesthetic tastes of large groups of people that become dominant in the media and dominant in society and then affect the economic resources that either prop up or destroy certain kinds of urban spaces. Uh, I'm also part of a larger consumer culture and visual culture where other people like me really enjoy, we get pleasure from seeing Vesuvio Bakery. But the products might not be part of our social spaces. Or if, they, if the visuals are part of our social spaces, the stores might be selling things that are quite different. Or as in the case of chains like Starbucks, there's a kind of universal new set of tastes developing that displaces the old social spaces and replaces them with something quite different. Um, in, in my book, written especially for a New York audience, uh, there's a huge reference, as Fran Tonka suggested, to the debate about whether Jane Jacobs or Robert Moses should dominate decisions about cities. Uh, Jane Jacobs, of course, represents the urban village point of view. Robert Moses, as I, as I say in Naked City, represents the corporate city point of view. And really what we get over and over again is a meeting between the, the urban village and the corporate city in a way that neither Moses nor Jacobs could have anticipated in the early 1960s. And it's, it's the aesthetics of the urban village that are juxtaposed to the aesthetics of the corporate city, the small, intimate social space representing an immigrant group or a working class, juxtaposed to the monolithic, uh, tall towers of the corporate city, a seeming disjunction 
between these two sets of tastes that are reconciled increasingly by people who work in the toll towers and shop in the intimate spaces. So that we're looking, in terms of authenticity, we're looking at the power of groups of people to claim urban space by claiming urban village aesthetics. So we really have to, have to consider that point of authenticity as social sustainability, not all, just authenticity as a set of physical structures, but authenticity as a way of protecting peoples and groups right to form their cultural identity in the spaces they inhabit, even if they can't afford to pay high rents. In other words, I wrote this book in terms of authenticity, but what I'm really arguing in favor of is rent controls. However, if you talk about rent controls in New York City, people think you're utterly obsolete, in, not in touch with reality, and neither politicians nor most people will pay any attention to that. So, uh, in a way, I can, I can confess that I wrote this book about the right to the city in terms of authenticity rather than in terms of rent controls because I wanted people to pay attention to what I say. That's, you know, maybe not a, um, a nice thing to confess, but I, I did want people to listen to me and not to dismiss what I'm saying. Uh, by, by seeing me as a socialist rather than a sociologist, which is usually my fate when I appear on, on uh, panel discussion, in panel discussions with property developers in New York. I'm introduced as a sociologist, but people are really thinking socialist with horns. Uh, so that's why I did, did not write a book called Social Justice in the City, but uh, The Death and Life of Authentic Urban Places. And this is not just a New York story. This is a story that uh, is true, as I suggested before, in Hong Kong or Shanghai uh, or possibly even Cape Town and London, uh, where Harry Kunzru, the novelist, write a very nice, wrote a very nice essay about Broadway Market, uh, where he lives, and he blamed his own tastes uh, for imposing a new set of cultural practices in that area, and I really liked what he said. He, you know, he likes his French cheese, and uh, his his tastes for a certain kind of cheese eventually will be combined with other people's economic resources to displace the small indigenous, if I can say, indigenous shops by shops that sell completely different upscale products. Even though he doesn't want to be a part of this, and neither do I want to be a part of this, neither do many people want to be uh, a part of processes of displacement. So uh, what sorts of elements go together in our analysis? Well, uh, we have to choose our terms. Are we going to talk about the inevitable upscaling of areas of the city as people with money move into them, or are we going to talk about a capitalist definition of urban growth? Are we going to talk about the gradual disappearance of old social groups or their displacement by force? Are we going to talk about the standardization of, uh, of urban life by chain stores, as we say in, in New York, and, or you could say in London? Or are we going to use the more fraught term of suburbanization? Because after all, a lot of those chain stores, like Walmart and Costco, uh, come from the suburbs, where they transpose their big box stores and large parking lots into the somewhat smaller premises of cities. Are we going to talk about people's consciousness of loss, even young people's consciousness, that something is being lost quite rapidly in urban experience? Or are we going to blame nostalgia? Are we going to talk about the use of consumption spaces, stores, restaurants, cafes, bars, to establish an authentic urban identity? Or are we going to criticize consumer culture? In the model that I propose in Naked City, I say we have to take account of four elements of urban change, capital and the state to be sure, but also media representations and consumers' tastes. Now these elements may seem quite 
natural and normal to you now in 2010, but they're not the ordinary political economists' uh, concepts. To build media and tastes into a model is already to marry urban political economy and cultural analysis, but it's something that I think we, we have to do. So the, the, the institutional field in which we're operating in, includes the, the, usual, uh, the usual factors, but also uh, the presence since, since 2003 of media blogs and websites in transforming sites that may emerge spontaneously often because of the, the work of new population groups, whether they are hipsters or immigrants who are non-hipsters, um, in the form of blogs, websites, comments, like the comments on Curbed.com, that push an, an, an experience of the city, promote an image of, an, of the city as being an authentic social experience. And we have to talk about people's tastes. We have to talk about the detrimental effect on low-income populations of the aesthetic preferences for an urban village of small shops and shopkeepers who sell quite expensive goods. What do these tastes really represent in terms of the right to specific spaces? <coughs> So what are the processes that we live through now that enhance the value of authenticity? These processes of large-scale change, gentrification, immigration, and globalization that uproot old sites and replace them with new sites so that people are aware in their everyday transit of the city. They're aware that things are changing. It's not just the demolition of old buildings that makes people feel that, thing, that the ground is shifting under their feet. It's a replacement of local sources, a replacement of uh, old time, long time residents and shopkeepers by new ones, and uh, a, a raising of property values and rents embodied by people called gentrifiers. But I don't want to defend old authenticity. As I suggested at the beginning, authenticity includes the very new as well as the very old. And people are forming authenticity. They're inventing authenticity all the time. So that the pupusa sellers of uh, Salvador in a public park in Brooklyn they are creating authenticity. In my book, I talk about how they were nearly, um, nearly uh, evicted from their selling points by a combination of city agency fiats in 2007, uh, even though they had been selling in this spot for 30 years. And uh, I, I like to think of uh, the, the triumph of the pupusa cookers and sellers as a, a cooks and sellers, as a, a triumph of new authenticity, partly with the support of uh, gentrifiers in their blogs. New authenticity is also seen on Fulton Street in Bedford-Stuyvesant, where there is a large African and South Asian Muslim population in an old African-American neighborhood. And the blending of cultural contributions makes for a new authenticity that is quite different from that of any single population group. Also in Williamsburg, which I write about in, in Naked City, uh, the displacement of artists and other creatives by uh, speculative, uh, speculative rents and new real estate development makes, makes one feel that the authenticity of hipsters should be protected in some way. So authenticity is invented in our original site, the Vesuvio Bakery, by the new bird bath, which is now ensconced in the old Vesuvio. But of course, people have posted negative <coughs> comments on, uh, on blogs. 
and uh, people complain. Uh, it's, it, it says Vesuvio. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't say birdbath. Uh, uh, why not say this really is birdbath? It's no longer the old Vesuvio. It's not. A, they, they don't say it's not authentic. But there are. They're saying it's inauthentic, and it should say that it's authentic. It should mark its inauthenticity. Uh, again, you know, people are are are, are trying to, to sort out what is authentic about this space. Is it new? Is it old? Is it uh, is it original? Is it original in an old sense? Is it original in a new sense? Is it still there, or is it not still there? And I kind of like this because it uh, it it makes the the point that. Preserving even a little bit of history is a delicate thing. It's a very sensitive process of trying to connect something new to authentic <laughs> urban space. Uh, there was a huge DKNY mural at the corner of Houston and, uh, Street and Broadway, uh, which I was asked about the other day. It, 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 it was quite remarkable for its giant size and also for its joining of a visual image of New York City with the corporate logo of uh, the DKNY company. Uh, but that mural or that billboard advertisement has been replaced by an advertisement for another uh, corporate clothing firm and uh, just the replacement of one advert by another advert uh, reminds this person that preserving a bit of history is a delicate thing and I'd like to think about that as a motto for authentic urban spaces. Because what we do see is the preservation in an almost museum-like setting within stores uh, and other consumption spaces <coughs> of whole neighborhoods. So that Forever 21, I don't know, do you have that here? It's sort of like Topshop. Um, it's a US chain of uh, low price clothing for mostly for young people. Forever 21 has a, a new uh, flagship store in Times Square where there are showcases named for different neighborhoods of New York City. And this is the, the Soho Showcase. And then Urban Outfitters, which is another clothing chain, uh, created this new shop in Manhattan, uh, which looks from the outside like uh, a neighborhood um, mini market, or I don't know what you call them here, but a news agent or someone who sells all sorts of little products, uh, magazines, newspapers, uh, open all night, um, usually owned and staffed by uh, new immigrants. Uh, but it's, this is not. This happens to be an Urban Outfitters clothing boutique. Or uh, the, uh, the bowling alley, which has uh, just been created in the old New York Times headquarters, because the New York Times moved to a new office building a few blocks away. And the bowling alley has incorporated uh, displays like Times Square and Chinatown within the bowling alley, <laughs> not outside. You won't find a tawdry Times Square outside the New York Times building anymore. You'll find it as this kind of Disney-fied display. Uh, people have criticized, including me, people have criticized the new Times Square as being Disney-fied, but even the interiors are now Disney-fied as representations of the urban spaces that used to be outside. So what, what is this authenticity that we're reinventing, and where is it being reinvented? That's a question that I, I want to leave you with. Uh, can we create the, the, uh, the controls, the rent controls, the use controls, uh, the rules that will allow old physical structures, old social spaces, and uh, new ones to stand side by side in an authentic city? So these are the sorts of questions I'm concerned with, and I'd like to hear what you have to say.
Thank you to Sharon Zukin. We have some time for questions uh, from the floor, and we have some mics, I think. Renee, down the front. This, I should interject, is the person I was complaining to over lunch for having stolen my copy of Loft Living for two years, but uh, he's given it back, so you can have the first question. <laughs> um, I have a question regarding kind of the invented aesthetics of authenticity. Um, I'm right now involved in a refurbishment of a building that's just five minutes walk from there in Bleecker Street. And it was a building that was inhabited by a scholar with a lot of library space on the two ground, kind of like an upper and lower ground floor. And what it's being, or what I'm complicit in doing now is converting it to exactly the same front that it had in the 1920s when it was a street full of fur shops with a lot of glass in the front. And, and to me, it's quite interesting to see it because what is being done is some, to create something that is more authentic than the use that it had had for the past 50, 60 years. So... I was wondering, I, I see this, and yes, it's being adapted, but what about the invention of aesthetics that are kind of, you know, not corporate so much, that use the aesthetics of the urban village, but are kind of, you know, more authentic than the authentic? And I see that all over, happening in that neighborhood particularly. There are all these new, like, little bars opening that look like they've been there for 50 years, and they can only work so well because there's such a widespread shared understanding globally in our sort of ideas of what is artisanal manufacturing, what are artisanal spaces that are so uniform that right now you can invent aesthetics everywhere in an instant. Uh, I can only say yes. <laughs> uh, I, uh, my, my, my students love to discuss the, the invention of aesthetics and uh, the, the definition of what are hipster aesthetics. Uh, when, uh, when we work on uh, Orchard Street on the Lower East Side in a research project that I'm directing on local shopping streets, you can, you can see the uh, appropriation of the historical storefronts, the displays, the lettering, the names of the shops, and understand these immediately, uh, cognitively, as uh, uh, signs of a certain co sensibility. So all, again, all I can say is yes, this is the way it is, and maybe it represents uh, a desire for re-enchantment, maybe it represents uh, the end of the end of history, uh, resistance to the end of history. I don't, I, I, I don't know, but uh, th there is this, uh, this retro mode in, in aesthetics uh, where people in food or in signage or n not in clothing, perhaps, uh, except for, for vintage shops, where people of, of a certain economic standing want to return to an earlier standard that they feel is, for want of a better term, authentic. What can I say? I see this in Amsterdam also, where I'm, I'm doing research on another local shopping street this year, uh, where there are uh, bars that look as though they've been on the street since the 1850s, but in fact they've only been there since, some of them have only been there since the 1950s or the 1990s, but they are designed to look as though they have been there forever. And I, you know, I, would, I, I would guess, as might you guess, that these are uh, aesthetic attempts to deal with impermanence and, and fragility and the anxiety uh, caused by impermanence and fragility. I wanted to ask you about um, how the authentic is passing as a cover term in some of this work. You said, well, I'm talking about authenticity because no one will listen if no I say I, I want rent, rent controls control, yes. to allow for these kinds of uses. Um, but to what extent is authenticity a cover word for independent? That what you're counterposing is independent businesses, because all of these examples you're, you're giving us, not the residential um, restoration, um, are businesses. So it's independent businesses versus non-independent, non-local, chain, transnational. You can take it up through various kinds of scales. And these kinds of built forms only allow for certain kinds of uses because of the sheer size and the, the disposition of the, the space. So they lend themselves to um, the local, the smaller scale. 
entirely. But first, I, 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 I uh, must join the way you, you stated this to begin with. Um, I'd like authenticity to mean uh, any group's ability to define its cultural identity autonomously or fairly autonomously in its urban space, whether it's uh, you know one one an ethnic group, a social class, or a um, or a, uh, a a lifestyle cohort. Of course, this this involves a lot of conflict <coughs> over who has a right to claim the space against other groups' claims. But I I, I like the idea of a kind of independent uh, determination of cultural identity being part of authenticity. Nonetheless, uh, what is uh, a very important in, in what I think about and why I'm doing research on local shopping streets is a resistance to transnational corporate chains. Uh, I do think that individual ownership of, uh, of stores is a, a visible sign of resistance to corporatization. And I'd like to encourage, as with the pupusa sellers who are street vendors, not store owners, uh, I, I would like the uh, uh, local governments to encourage, to, to, to support, to subsidize means by which uh, small shopkeepers can reinvent the business form of the independent store, whether they're selling furniture that they design and build, or even selling French cheese, or selling, uh, as, as one does these days, uh, locally produced cheese. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see that. What I'd like to see also is training partnerships that um, enable low-income residents to join in these new businesses, regardless of what they're selling, so that we can partly overcome the conflict of interest between low-income groups uh, and consumers who buy expensive cheese, and whether a cheese is French or, or locally produced, uh, if, it's, if it's a product of small batch uh, artisanal production, it's probably going to be more expensive than supermarket cheese. And I'd, I'd like at least to bring uh, 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 people who might not buy that cheese into the new economy of this sort of retail enterprise. May I ask for um, another question? Uh, Mark, up the back. Um, I work uh, in a place um, where we have a lot of local, well, let's say, th uh, there's something going on uh, in terms of what you're talking about that has attracted a lot of attention uh, uh, of the kind you sort of referred to in Curbed, in the examples from Curbed.com, where people are kind of expressing their views over changes that are happening. And I, I find uh, sort of my reaction to some of the examples I saw in there, I don't know if this is true or not, but I thought, you know, a lot of times people don't know what they're talking about. Um, and the response is a response to a kind of a, an imaginary of the place that's transmitted via the media and actually has nothing to do with the real authentic place. And a, sort of a, a, in addition to that is that um, I work in a context where there's a, a very strong local community who are defending their sort of social practices. Uh, but we are subject to a weekly onslaught of kind of icon-seeking tourists. Uh, I suspect similar things have happened in places like Soho, uh, you know, where there is a kind of an identity of a place that becomes so strong, the, the image is so strong that people come for that, not really for the authentic experience, which would be to engage in the social practices as opposed to just take pictures of the icons. I don't know. Well, this, this, is, a, this is a good point. Uh, I'm reminded uh, of uh, the, the dramatic changes in Soho uh, from 1970 to the, to the present. It, I, I did a little, uh, this is not in the book, I did, I, I did a little uh, survey 
of selected areas of Soho in terms of the occupants of storefronts. In other words, who was in the ground floor spaces of uh, buildings on specific streets from, the 19, from 1970 to, to the present. And I found that, of course, there was a big shift from manufacturers or uh, services that sold uh, their uh, services that so that catered to manufacturers to art-related uh, stores, whether they were art galleries or, or other sorts of um, of businesses that cater to to artists and to and to art. And then there was a a, a gradual increase in individually owned retail stores. Stores. And then after 1990, and this is why I can say that on that slide about the post-1970 retail economy of Soho, there was a huge shift toward uh, uh, transnationally owned corporate chain stores uh, on, uh, uh, throughout Soho. So uh, I, I, I do wonder what happens when, when people uh, overrun a space looking for the authentic experience if there are no rules about preserving you know, whoever is in that space at that moment, the authentic experience is overwhelmed by uh, building owners raising the rents. And what happened in, in Soho, as, as many people here will know, is that the, the art galleries and art-related uses ran away to a cheaper area of Manhattan if there are any cheaper areas of Manhattan, but yes, they ran away to a cheaper area of Manhattan, and they've been replaced by, by chain stores. So uh, uh, it, it, it's really important to, to try to protect the existing uses. If users want them to, to stay there, it's really important to try to protect their right to remain there. And then I'll give another example of a totally uh, unmobilized uh, community. The area of Greenwich Village where I live, uh, um, my local shopping street is quite near New York University. That's not the university where I teach. It's the, the rich private university in contrast to the public university where I teach. Uh, New York University has bought up huge amounts of property, uh, not only in Greenwich Village, but throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn in the past 20 years. And they have a, a, a much larger residential student body than, than ever before who, uh, who live around there and to whom shops cater. So that my local shopping street, which had, when I first moved there, two small local supermarket uh, chain stores and then a, an, uh, an organic product store and a few dry cleaners and pharmacies. My neighborhood, going back to the 1920s, has been oversupplied with dry cleaners for some reason. I'm not sure that, that there's a historical continuity in the pursuit of cl personal cleanliness, but we have, have a lot of dry cleaners where I live. Uh, and when I moved there, there was a small fishmonger. Uh, there was a small butcher <laughs> shop and a working class cafe uh, and a few small restaurants. Now, every new business that is locating on that local shopping street is a restaurant, <coughs> a restaurant that's part of a larger chain and usually a restaurant that caters to students. I mean, it, not exactly, not McDonald's, but kind of uh, an upscale burger joint and uh, various kinds of restaurants that are, are parts of chains. So that my local shopping street before my very eyes is becoming, in my eyes, a less authentic place. Yet it's catering to a, 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 a transient but existing population of students. So these are, you know, these are problems that we, we all are, are living with, but we, we don't really talk about them. And we certainly don't press local government to come to grips with them and figure out with the stakeholders whose interests should determine the uses of the space.
I was thinking while you were speaking, actually, of another chapter for the book, which is a bit of a problem as it's already written. Uh, but you might tell a tale of two bakeries. You have the Vesuvio Bakery on the Lower East Side, and then in the West Village you have the Magnolia Bakery, oh, which seems great. to be an example of that phenomenon of which Mark's speaking, the, the sort of invention of, a, of, an, of an authentic New York experience, made famous, I think, by Sex and the City. Sex and the City, yes. And a, a queue outside this bakery <laughs> of, I assume, tourists. Uh, I, I, I think so, uh, although my daughter, who's sitting in the back of the room today, might be able to, to tell <laughs> to us. To confirm that more, or other. More, more, more but directly. it's the same. I mean, it looks very similar. It, it maintains that, that kind of I traditional I, I, storefront, I, as it I were. I guess so. It doesn't have a, 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 a visual reference to an, an immigrant group, but I guess it... Uh, I guess it has that, that uh, some sort of historical reference. I don't, re I don't know how old the Magnolia Bakery is, and I, I don't want to, to make a guess. But uh, yes, you're right, there's, there's always a queue of people uh, standing outside waiting to buy overpriced cupcakes. Yeah, that is the frontier of gentrification by cupcake. Shibani, just in front there. You've got a mic coming just there. Oh. Okay, um, I'll be a bit greedy and try to ask two questions. Very uh, quickly. Firstly, uh, uh, if you follow this idea of, of terroir, which is social practices, cultural identity, and geographical area, then a Nando's coming into a really charming old high street isn't really a conflict because now people want to go to Nando's and that's, that's what they can afford and they actually enjoy the chicken. So what do you think of that? And secondly, would you say that authenticity um, has something to do with the smallness of scale of producing space? Because, I mean, when it comes to master plans and huge developers, I think it's really hard to get people involved in, in the production of their cities. But, you know, so what do you think of that? Do you know what Nando's is? No. Uh, it's, a <laughs> uh, it's a chain restaurant, a chicken. I don't, I don't know what kind of chicken it is. <laughs> It's not my taste. Ah. A, a slightly, I mean, it's, it's more upmarket than KFC. Whole it's an eat-in. What's that? Portuguese. Whole chickens. Portuguese. Oh, Portuguese. <laughs> Portuguese. Uh, this, this, this reminds me of, of the chapter. Thank you, Leslie. This reminds me of the chapter in Naked City called Why Harlem is No Longer a Ghetto because of the, the, the tastes, I mean, I argue because of the tastes of uh, upper middle class new residents of Harlem, uh, who uh, represent many different regions of the world and different ethnic groups, and they don't, uh, for reasons of health or other reasons, they don't want to eat uh, chicken and wings or other examples of soul food, or s maybe once every few years they'll have a, a, a plate of chicken and uh, chicken and waffles. Sorry, chicken and waffles, but the other 99% of the time they'll eat salad. Uh, so, uh, yes, the, you know, the chicken question is an unexplored urban question that does have to do with authenticity, gentrification, and the right to the city. So I'm all for that kind of research. Uh, but yes, most of, the, uh, uh, most of the spaces that are conceived and represented by urban planners, developers, and officials are large spaces because chain stores are always on the move for new locations. Right now in New York City, the City Council is holding hearings on whether Walmart should be permitted to open stores in, in New York City. For many years, Walmart was not interested in locating in New York City. Now it is for various reasons that I don't have time to go into. And uh, the uh, uh, the, the problem is that residents want better shopping op opportunities, particularly in low-income neighborhoods. Chain stores represent a welcome standardization of brand name products uh, at, at relatively reasonable prices. Uh, so this, this is a, it's a real political issue about whether to regulate rents, which I've already said is a non-issue in New York City, whether to regulate the size of retail spaces, which has a little more credence and, and a little more support in, in large cities, or whether to try to legislate, uh, let's say, a quota of locally owned stores. It, you know, we, we, we have a, a program in New York City and I think in other places, of uh, using 1% of um, 
of something, the, the property value or the rent roll or something, using 1% to place art, public art, in new buildings. How about 1% for local shops? You know, 1% of something to support local shops. Again, bringing in uh, all kinds of people to run these shops and own these shops and work in these shops, not just highly educated people selling locally produced expensive cheese, but all kinds of things. But there, you know, there is a serious chicken question underneath all of this, and I, I admit that. I'm conscious of time. We have several people wanting to ask questions. I'm going to ask to take a couple at, at a time. Um, Tony, if you can ask your question, and then we also have up the back, sorry. Do you know everyone's name in this entire office? Just about. <laughs> And so just That's because the same people always ask questions, I fear, but still. Uh, Tony Travers from the LSE. Surely the further you move away from a, fun a fairly fundamentalist and rather naive view that anything that is old is authentic and anything that's authentic and old should be preserved, which would randomly keep things that were good or bad, the further you move away from that simple equation, the more it simply feeds all these decisions about what's kept into power elites mm. and those power elites will randomly decide what is and isn't authentic and what is or isn't kept and that is a real problem I think because you're left either with the fundamentalist approach or the endless power elite struggle approach. Mm. Just before you answer that we'll take a second question and I, I don't know your name I'm afraid so. Um, hi, I think this question actually matches a bit with uh, this gentleman's whose name I forgot. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm in the Department of Social Policy, so I'm going to look at this from a very, very different perspective, and I also worked for three years on affordable housing policy in Washington. So what I struck me about your presentation was um, the fact that authenticity was indicated through your slide with the low-income, I'm guessing, immigrant neighborhood somewhere in uh, New York City, or the fact that Vesuvio Bakery was originally a low-income neighborhood. And it's interesting that rich white people tend to really want to go back to low-income neighborhoods that they, I think, essentially push people out uh, in the beginning. But um, And finally, another point before I make my other point is the uh, bodega experience with uh, Urban Outfitters. I you know, lived in the low-income neighborhoods, and um, I think the people who live there don't find bodegas that charming because they don't usually have access to proper grocery stores where they can get fresh produce and food. And I can't help but think that this is somewhat an extremely white and elitist approach to what's authentic. And I can't help but wonder um, if you've ever interviewed low-income people in neighborhoods such as the immigrant neighborhood you cited and asked what they think is authentic and perhaps what they'd like from their neighborhood. I say this also because uh, in my work in Washington, we really worked to try to bring in mixed income situations so that low income people can benefit from the services that are not there when the authenticity is not, or the authenticity is there from the perspective of the rich right person but not from the poor whoever, whoever. So. Okay, so fundamentalism or power elites and then the elitism of authenticity as you mentioned at the start of the lecture. Well, these are all excellent questions and they are questions. I can't resolve uh, from the outside, any, any specific situation, stakeholders, residents, local authorities, they have, to, they have to struggle over what should be preserved and what should not be preserved. Uh, I guess what I'm arguing is that the social uses of space, not just the physical structures, should, uh, should have a chance to be preserved. What I'm, what I'm arguing against is uh, involuntary displacement. By the same token, I understand that uh, uh, groups that are in a place before other groups are often racist, exclusionary, um, and not generally welcoming of, uh, of new people. And uh, I, I can only say that like democracy, authenticity is something that has to be argued over. And it, it, it often will be resolved by power, whether it's the power of the state to enact controls or the power of capital investors to push some uses out and impose others. 
uh, power is going to be pa power is going to be decisive in one way or another, uh, but it should be a more democratic use of power that that makes the decision about what should be preserved. Uh, there are uh, cases of, uh, in New York City at, at least, of immigrant shops that do not serve residential populations, but that serve uh, uh, immigrant populations who travel to those shops. And there are people like the Red Hook uh, food vendors who sell pupusas in Red Hook ball fields who have never lived in Red Hook. Uh, and don't serve the residential population, but they began selling the foods of their countries, Mexico, Salvador, um, Colombia, uh, to soccer players who used those ball fields beginning in the 1970s when they were totally derelict and, uh, and crime, crime uh, threatened. So um, these are, these are all spaces that have to be fought over. And maybe that's not a cheerful prospect, but for me it's a more cheerful prospect than saying let the market decide. Because that's usually what decides which, which uses and physical structures will be preserved. And I guess that's, that's sort of an answer to, uh, to your question also. That uh, I'm, I'm just trying to ask for cultural terms to be allowed into the discussion and for the discussion to take place. We have two more questions. Um, you're going to pass? Okay, but Andrea, who is just behind. And then over here. Andrea Colantonio, let's see this. My question is related to the previous questions, and I was wondering whether you come across um, rich neighborhood which are authentic and what is the relationship between uh, authenticity and income and wealth? I mean is unidirectional or do, do communities um, become less authentic as become richer? And just before you sorry, ask the question, take the question over here, you have the mic. I had a few things that have changed in the course of the conversation. Uh, I just wanted to say I don't consider my, this is a reference to what you were saying briefly, I consider myself poor, but it doesn't mean that I have to just kind of like consume in kind of a singular modality. I don't go, it's actually cheaper for me in my locality to shop in the local markets. And it's a kind of a more of a complex formation going on with local farmer markets, uh, with existing businesses and alternating days. So it's something interesting going on in some of the locations. But I wanted, to, well, I wanted you to really say more about, you talked about openness and a certain person embodying uh, certain, um, creating old practices within uh, Vesuvia Bakery, but you didn't actually talk about the texture and the nature of what those practices were, and I was interested in that, because quite often it is about particular people. And right, to your last point, I know of a, a new, or what I consider a, an authentic eating place in Brixton, it's what I call Moroccan shack in an old fish and chip kind of van. But I'm aware, it's, I feel it's authentic, but you get very few women eating there. There's no demo, I, I can't, I mean, I don't know how, what that really means, but I can't really imagine a democratic process which would open that up. I don't, I mean, this is a, one of the kind of invisible kind of boundaries. Okay, well maybe there should be women's restaurants that would be authentic, right? Or women's cafes where women would feel comfortable, just as there are uh, <laughs> railroad cars in some countries for women so that they, they feel comfortable and, and uh, physically, uh, socially comfortable <coughs> in, those, in those spaces. I don't know, maybe I'll take on a job as restaurant consultant for women's, women's mm. restaurants. Um, you must live near Borough Market. No, I no? don't. It's expensive. Oh, okay. I live near Okay. Um, can rich neighborhoods be authentic? This is a, this is a very interesting question because uh, uh, you know, my, my gut reaction is to say, no, rich neighborhoods can't be authentic, only poor neighborhoods can be authentic. And of course, that's a stupid uh, uh, reaction. 
Um, I, I would go back to uh, Fran's comment and question of a few minutes ago. Uh, I think of the Upper East Side of Manhattan, which is a very, very rich neighborhood, and I, I would, would think about the small, individually owned retail shops that have been priced out of that area and been replaced by uh, transnational corporate chains selling very expensive products. I mean, there still are some independently owned shops there, but many more of them have been displaced. I guess the feeling of authenticity uh, comes in, in part from the, the scale of the, uh, the space and the persona, shall I say, of the shopkeeper who, uh, like Tony Dopolito, the owner of Vesuvio Bakery, can really make or break a space. Now, when Jane Jacobs wrote about the, the sidewalk ballet in uh, uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, um, she was really writing about the role of the shopkeeper in taking responsibility for interactions among strangers in the public space of the sidewalk. Uh, in it, with chain stores, you don't have the individuals uh, who are taking responsibility for the hospitality of the public space. You, you, you have a larger scale, but you also don't have the individual persons who take on a persona in that space. And I venture to say that in uh, independently owned shops, in many cases, you don't have customers interacting with each other and sitting around uh, what, what in the US would be the cracker barrel of the 19th century general store. Uh, which was mainly white men sitting around and excluding white women and everybody else, African Americans and, and Native Americans in those times and places, from their little uh, camaraderie. Uh, but uh, you, you, you don't have that, that kind of lateral interaction. I venture to say that most people interact with the shopkeeper in these bilateral uh, in, in interactions or dyads or whatever sociologists uh, call them. But the feeling of the space, the experience of the space is different and maybe we use the word authentic to describe the feeling we get in those spaces. But we do feel attached. We feel as though we belong in the space. Um, I, you know, if I can generalize from my N equals one, when I go to the dry cleaners in in my local shopping street and chat, or when I go to the farmer's market and chat with the seller of the, of the produce, uh, whether it's local, locally grown or not locally grown, I feel attached in this day and age because I don't take responsibility for an extended household and uh, maybe I don't belong to a religious congregation or a political association in the area where I live. Uh, I, I feel attached through these consumption spaces and I don't feel attached uh, in New York City when I go to Whole Foods Market and queue up for one of the 32 cash registers and I never see the same cashier twice. Uh, I, I feel attached when I go into a small shop and I know the person whom I'm dealing with and she knows me, maybe not intimately, but we know each other and I can even chat with other people in the space of the store even though I don't know them. We need, I'm afraid, to uh, draw to a close. Apologies to all of you who wanted to ask questions because there were several people who didn't have the opportunity to. Um, you may ha get a very quick piece of um, Sharon's ear and mind outside with the book signing. Um, but thank you all for your um, questions and your attendance tonight. And thank you, Sharon. Thank you.